he's worthy of all the praise and all the glory. He deserves everything. Let's enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Right now, wherever you are, why don't you lift your hands and lift your voice and begin to magnify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's worthy. He's worthy of all the praise and all the glory. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving today and into his courts with praise. We're thankful and we'll bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth through all generations. I'm thankful I know him today and I know he is in control this, this afternoon. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, or today, I should say, we're filming this on Friday night, but uh, this is, if you're joining us, you're no doubt joining us on a Sunday morning and for our Sunday morning service, and we're thankful that you're here with us. Uh, we're, we're so glad that you're joining us online. I know it's been a crazy couple of uh, weeks uh, with everything going on in our world, but I'm thankful that God is in the building. It feels good here at Calvary Tabernacle. We've come tonight expecting God to do great things. I hope where you're, wherever you're joining us, whether you're at the house or in your car, uh, on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, does not matter. However you're joining us tonight, I hope and pray that you are blessed by what God wants to do today. And God wants to minister in your life. Amen. We serve a mighty big God. We are going to go to the word of the Lord. And uh, I believe God's going to minister in a mighty way today. We're going to turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, for the reading of the word of the Lord. And if you've got your Bibles at home right now, your cell phones, go ahead and look it up on your Bible, earmark it, because it'll be a good verse to keep in your arsenal. You'll want to memorize this one. It's a really good one. Uh, but at, don't forget, as, as uh, we're talking here, uh, we are doing online church during all of the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, God's doing great things and it's making us adjust. But I just want to give you a quick reminder. You can view online services through our Facebook page. You can also go to our website, calvarytab.life. Check out our new website and it is a work in progress. So bear with us. Uh, but you can also check us out on YouTube. Calvary Tabernacle now has its own YouTube channel. And so you can search Calvary Tabernacle Alto, Texas in the search uh, uh, bar there at the top of you, the YouTube search engine and you can find us, subscribe to our channel and you'll be able to see all of our videos that we post. Uh, again, this is making us do more than just service online during this, but it's, it's causing us to do recorded services now from hopefully now on and we'll just get better as we go. Amen. Let's go to the word of the Lord. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 simply says this. Paul writes and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Amen. I'm glad I know that today. Now, let me go ahead and give you my title. Some of you sitting uh, in front of your computers right now are going to think I've lost my mind. In fact, uh, you may, uh, may have even come across this online just by the title itself, but I've come to talk to us today from this thought, this subject, blessings of a boll weevil. Blessings of a boll weevil. And punch your neighbor sitting in the recliner next to you. High five your kids as they walk by. Tell them, say, I don't know what this preacher's going to talk about, but we're going to have some fun today. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Uh, we're going to get into the word of the Lord today. Now, let me go ahead and begin by saying this or asking this question. Uh, in a rhetorical question at best, how many of you have ever even heard of a boll weevil? Now, it, it maybe some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. Let me do a little explaining. It's a little beetle that measures only one-fourth of an inch long. This boll weevil absolutely loves cotton. In fact, that's where it gets its name. It, 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 it's, it, it gets its name from the fact that it it devours the bulls of cotton. And in fact, its love for cotton is what makes the boll weevil so infamous. About 1890, boll weevils crossed the border from Mexico and began to wreak havoc on cotton farms across the southern United States. 
By 1910, just 20 years, the boll weevil epidemic had reached all the way from the southern border of the United States to the state of Alabama. The problem was that cotton was king in the South. Since the days before the Civil War, the South had relied heavily on its cotton production, and it had become its staple economy. The boll weevil now threatened to destroy not just a crop, cash crop, but it began to threaten the very existence of whole communities and cities. The boll weevil now threatened to destroy the very fiber of society. Many cotton producers were on the verge of bankruptcy simply because their crops were being destroyed by an army of extremely little bugs. Realizing that something had to be done, a little town in southeastern Alabama decided to act, and Enterprise Alabama reached the news. Enterprise Alabama was a town located in Coffee County, Alabama, and the primary crop was cotton. Surprising, since it was called Coffee County, like the name would imply. Cotton was actually the number one crop. And in a few short years, the boll weevil, uh, after the boll weevil began its onslaught in Coffee County, the, the, the county had lost 60% of its cotton production. Amazing, devastating. The economic outlook was very grim and all hopes seemed lost. However, Enterprise Alabama decided to take a chance. And they began to look for other crops to produce uh, something that would produce that was immune to the boll weevil and yet still be profitable for their little community. Their answer lay in peanuts. Now, they took their cue from George Washington Carver, the renowned scientist, and the citizens of Enterprise began to cultivate peanuts. And the results were astounding. By 1917, Coffee County, Alabama, and more specifically, Enterprise, Alabama, would lead the nation in peanut production. Guess what? Wealth was created and literally the entire area was saved from economic disaster. In fact, two years later in 1919, the citizens of Enterprise made a very interesting decision. To commemorate their struggle and again their success, they erected a monument in downtown Enterprise and their chief guest or their guest of honor, I should say, to commemorate this, this occasion was the boll weevil. That's right. Enterprise Alabama built a monument in honor of a bug. In fact, you can go today to Enterprise Alabama and you can see the monument that they erected downtown Enterprise, Alabama to the boll weevil. Years later, they would add a metal plaque or a metal replica of the boll weevil on top of the statue and on the base of the monument on a plaque. These words were inscribed in profound appreciation of the boll weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity. This monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. I've come to talk to you now for the next few minutes. Again, maybe it'll make sense by the time I'm done. I've come to talk to you today about blessings of a boll weevil. I've learned something about life, and I know I'm young compared to some, but I've learned something about life uh, that we are in one of three areas of life. We are either in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or going in a crisis. We call that entire process life. Uh, you and I will face obstacles, problems, pitfalls, disappointments, struggles, tests, trials, valleys, and setbacks. In fact, there's no doubt today that we are in a trial. Don't just talk about COVID-19, Pastor. Let's talk about real problems. Let's talk about problems that are dealing you're dealing with today. No doubt there may be some right now under the sound of my voice that, that, that you're listening to this and you're thinking of the problems that you deal with. It could be depression, addiction, loneliness, fear, and doubt. It could be broken marriages. It could be rebellious children. It could be job loss. It could be sickness in your body. It's all kinds of trials and tribulations, crisis and 
problems, situations, and circumstances that you and I cannot seem to overcome. May I just go on record and inform you that these obstacles were not meant to destroy you. They are meant to make you. They are meant to develop you. They are meant to help you become what God wants you to become. If you don't believe me, turn with me to the book of Psalms chapter 66 and you can begin reading in verse number 10. The Bible says, For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou brought it up, brought it us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast calls men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. David picks up the pen and wants every reader to understand that, that though I've been through the fire, I, I've come out unscathed. Uh, though I've been through the water, I did not drown. Uh, it does not matter what trial or situation comes my way. Uh, everything is meant to make me uh, what God has called me to be. Paul writes to the church in Rome. And he's, if you study the book of Romans, you'll find very quickly that it's a very deep theological book. It is incredible to talk about and read and study. And, and chapter 8 is one of the, 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 the most incredible chapters of the entire book as it begins to talk about God's love and the fact that we're adopted into His family, sons and daughters of the Most High. And, and I don't have time to go into that, but in all of this writing, Paul gives a little nugget of truth that you and I need to grasp a hold of and hold dear to our hearts. He says, and we know. Paul says in the midst of all the problems, in the midst of all the circumstances, there's one thing I know, and that is that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. I want to be clear about something today. It does not say that all things are good. It does not say that every circumstance is right. It doesn't mean that every situation that you face... It, it, gives you a warm fuzzy feeling. No my friend, it doesn't take long of living this life that, that we understand this very fact that not all things are good and not all things are, are wonderful and there are things in life that, that we often wonder why God did you make me go through that but God in his word speaks to the apostle Paul and says you tell the church I want them to understand that all things, no matter good, bad or ugly, no matter what it may be, all things work to Together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. I want to remind somebody today that every single thing in your world, no matter what it is, no matter what God, God has allowed you to go through, everything works together for the good if you love God. If you'll cling to that old rugged cross, I promise you, God's going to bring you out. If you'll just hold on to the Master's hand, I promise you God's got a plan. You may not can see it right now, but He's making you something pure. You may not can understand it this side of your struggle, but my friend, I've come to remind you that God is refining you as silver is refined. Amen. Hallelujah. Understand with me today that the Bible is filled with great men and women of God. And the reason for their greatness is very simple. It's not their birthday. It's not who they're born to. It doesn't mean, matter how much money they've got or, or what prestigious lofty position they ever obtain. Their reason for their greatness is simple. They simply became great because they overcame obstacles. In fact, go through the Bible. Forever Noah, there's a flood. Forever Abraham, there's a decision to leave home. For Sarah, there's a barren womb. For Moses, there's an Egyptian. For Joshua, there's a Jericho. For Gideon, there's a Midianite army. For Elijah, there's a Jezebel. For Daniel, there's a lion's den. For the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there's a fiery furnace. For Ezekiel, there's a valley of dry bones. For Peter, there's a denial. For Paul, there's a thorn in the flesh. And for Jesus himself, there's a cross. But in the end, if you go to the back of the book, if you finish their stories out, you'll find that at the end of their stories, there's a promise. There's a... There's there's a place prepared. There's a blessing. There's a, there's a heaven. There's a crown of glory. If you just keep holding on, I promise you everything's going to work out for the best. I want to say something here. 
If you're taking notes right now, you need to write it down because this will, this will change your life. God is more interested in your commitment than he is in your comfort. I hope you caught that. God is more interested in your commitment than he is in your comfort. I, I've said it before multiple times. God is not so much worried about your, you just living a comfortable life. Although there are blessings in living for God. And if you will apply biblical principles to your life, you will see the blessings of God. But I want you to understand something that is more paramount for God. That you are saved than for you to be comfortable. You need to hear me today. You need, to, you need to get this in your mind. God will do whatever He can to save you. In fact, Peter tells us that it is not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God will do whatever it takes to save you. You hear me very clear today. God wants your relationship. God wants to, the key to your heart. God wants to know you like never before. And He will go to great lengths to make sure you are saved. Don't look at that problem like it's a problem. Look at it like it's an opportunity to grow closer to God. I've seen people get beat up on the outside and you think, how are they going to make it? But you look up and they're praying more. And they're seeking God's face. You don't understand the trial on the onset, but at the end of the circumstance, you realize that God is using that to draw them closer. My friend, you may be going through it today, but don't give up and don't give out because God is reaching for you. It just may be you're one step away from your miracle. It just may be you're one step away from your promise. God's working in your life. Don't give up today. I was listening to a sermon the other day and a preacher by the name of Martin Ballestero is an evangelist that I've listened to for years and years. An older gentleman that's, that's seen a lot of great things in his life and experienced a lot of um, amazing miracles uh, in his ministry. Uh, he tells a story about an incident that had happened several years ago. He had just recently resigned the church that he had pastored for several years and, and he, was, he was preaching off somewhere doing some evangelism and uh, wasn't just loaded down with cash. He didn't have a lot of money on him. In fact, he had $150 in his pocket to be exact. And uh, it was going to be going all weekend. And he got on the road, drove, driving several hundred miles. And, and as he's driving down the road, he has a flat. And he, he was able to fix the flat and wheel into the nearest Sam's Club. He had bought the tires from Sam's Club. And, and he walked, wheeled in there and, and, he, and he had purchased a road hazard warranty type thing on the tires. And Went up to the counter and the man began to talk to him and he explained, you know, this is what I've got. And the guy said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I, I've got a deal going on right now. I'll replace that tire and, a, and I, I'll, I'll replace two of your tires. If you'll buy two of your, my tires, I'll replace all four of them for the price of just two tires. He said, okay, well, how much is that going to be? He said, that's $102. Well, if you got $150 in your pocket, and you know you got to fill up on the way out there, and you got to fill up on the way back, and you got to eat. That's cutting it pretty close. And Brother Ballastero said, I, I stood there at the counter in Sam's Club and thought, I don't know if I can do that. That's a, I know that's a good deal, but that's not a good deal for me. That's a little more expensive than what I need it to be. And, and, and he got to thinking about it. And, and as he's thinking about it, he just kind of felt the little nudge. And, and it just kind of felt like, go ahead and do it. God's got this. And, and, and so he told the gentleman, he said, I'll tell you what, yeah, go ahead and go ahead and fix the tires. I'll take that deal. Go ahead and do that. And he's kind of in the back of his mind thinking, how in the world am I ever going to make it this weekend? That's not enough cash in my pocket to get me home. And all of a sudden, as the man is yelling at the people in the back to go ahead and get the, the car in, we're going to fix all four of these tires, put them new tires on and all of that. All of a sudden, Brother Ballastero feels a tap on his shoulder and he turns around and Brother Ballastero, his words were that he engaged this man to be somewhere in his 70s. An old man, he had never seen the man before. Said, I turned around, looked him in the eye, and the gentleman reached out and handed me a $100 bill. Walked, turned around and walked out the door. Never said a word. Didn't know who he was. Have no clue to this day who he was. He didn't even give me a chance. He said, I was shocked. I couldn't even catch the guy. He just turned around and walked off. Never saw him again. He said, I stood at the counter at Sam's. And it was like God spoke to me very, very, very boldly and very loudly there in, the, in, in Sam's counter. And he said, you know, if you'll just trust me, I'll take care of you. 
But just remember, sometimes before I can give you a blessing, I've got to make you have a blowout. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you hear what I just said. I know you feel like you're spinning out of control because your world has had a blowout. But may I remind you that the God that created you knows exactly where you are. And he is not, he is not, his eyes are not, not blind. His ears are not deaf to your cry. My friend, he hears you. He sees you. And you may feel like you're having a blowout. But sometimes God has to get you to have a blowout before you could ever see a blessing in your world. In his autobiography entitled Gifted Hands, Dr. Ben Carson writes, Success is determined not by whether or not you face obstacles obstacles but by your reaction to them and if you look at these obstacles as a containing fence they become your excuse for failure but if you look at them as a hurdle each one strengthens you for the next can i just apply that to the spirit and remind you that god may have set some things and obstacles in your world but he's getting ready to show you that he is still the god that overcomes obstacles he's still the god that makes a way in the midst of the red sea he's still a god that makes a way when there seems to be no other way the bible again is filled with men who had obstacles Joseph's story is probably one of the most powerful stories concerning obstacles. We know him as a boy with a coat of many colors. But we also see him as a man betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery. A slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar, who was a very prestigious man, who, for lack of a better term, was the head of the secret police and Pharaoh's bodyguard. This man who could kill at a moment's notice. David or Joseph served him. We see him lied about, lied on, and abused, thrown into prison, and then forgotten. And it seems like this dream of his has completely disappeared, but God was preparing him and shaping him and molding him. Ehud looks like another, another example of a man with great obstacles, a man who's lived in slavery, who's been oppressed. His people have lived bound uh, by, by, by the enemy. And, and yet the Bible even goes so far as to tell us in the book of Judges that he was a man left-handed. That original Hebrew makes us realize that it's not just the talk about his dexterity, but the fact that he was a man left-handed. The original phrase work there literally means that he was handicapped. He could not use his right hand. He had to use his left hand because some way, somehow he had become handicapped and he was not able to use his strong arm. Uh, yet this man would deliver Israel uh, from their enemy uh, when Eglon king of Moab would come in to destroy them it was Ehud crippled up old Ehud uh, that couldn't do everything like everybody else thought he should uh, he, he didn't have it all together but God would use and anoint this man my friend what am I trying to tell you I'm trying to let you know that there's blessings uh, from a bold weevil uh, it may look like a curse uh, but God's doing great things uh, it may look like you're going to fall apart but my friend let me remind you God's still holding your world together and he's doing something today. Let me tell you something. I'll go back to what I said originally. God is very interested in your commitment so much more so than your comfort. And if God will take and use a sickness to save you, he will do it. And if God will take a financial difficulty to make you trust him, he'll do it. And if God will do, if God can use a, a loss, a job loss, or, or the loss of someone you love uh, to get you to pray again, my friend, he will do it. Why? Because God wants you in relationship with him. The greatest thing I can say about COVID-19 is it's making us trust God. The greatest thing I can say about situations in my life that I didn't quite understand at the time, it made me stop and trust God. And I can tell you right now that God uh, is always on time and He's always doing a work and He always works it out. And I promise you, looking back, it makes me go, duh, I knew that. God, God had it all together. I'm telling you, God will take bold evils and turn them into blessings. As I prepare to close, let me remind you about something that I find very interesting in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 23, verses 27 through 30 give us an interesting revelation concerning the conquest of Canaan. Israel has swept through the land of Canaan. They've come to the promised land. Joshua has, has seen great, or they're preparing to, Joshua has already seen some, some great things happening and, 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 and Moses is getting ready to hand the baton off to him. Here in Exodus 23, they're preparing for this moment, but God begins to speak, and He gives to give begins to give clarity to, clarity to the issue. 
Notice what he tells Moses. He says, I will send my fear before thee. And I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. I'll send hornets before thee. And they shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite all before thee. Now that sounds great. Wonderful. God's going to do it. God's going to give us the victory. Let me tell you, God's word's already given us the victory. We already know what the end of the, end of the book says. We know that God is going to make a way. And we win. But notice what God says. He says, I will not. Drive them out before thee in one year. Why not, God? You can do it, God. Just go ahead and make it all happen. Come on, God. Just do it right now. Turn it around right now. He says, I'm not going to do it. Lest the land become desolate. And the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little. I'll drive them out before thee. Until thou be increased. And inherit the land. Come on, God, why don't, you just, why don't you just make us have revival all right now? God, why don't you just fill the house right now? God, why can't we just have all the blessings right now? God, why can't you heal me right now? God, why can't you fix it right now? Anybody else impatient or is it just me? My friends, I'm telling you, God says, no, 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 no. Little by little. Little by little. Bowl weevil by bowl weevil. Peanut by peanut. Here a little, there a little. Just keep walking with me. Keep trusting me. I've got a blessing for you. I'm doing something in your world right now. And you can't see it. You can't understand it. You don't have it all figured out in this side of the situation. But can I just promise you that what I'm working in your life is going to blow your mind? My friend, no matter what you're going through today, no matter the fear that you face, no matter the anxiety that's in your life, can I just speak a word into your world and tell you that God knows exactly what He's doing. And in the midst of your darkest night, God says, I'll be a light. I've got you. I know where you are. And I will guide you and I will make you into something wonderful. Right now, wherever you are, I wonder if you could just lift your hands. If you believe what God is doing, would you just lift up your hands and lift up your voice? And right now, would you begin to ask God to work, even when, he can't, when you can't see it, even when you can't feel it? Would you just ask the Lord to begin to work? God, help me to trust you. Help me to walk according to your will. Help me to walk according to your principles and your promises. I, I know, God, I can't see it right now. I, I don't have it all understood right now. But God, would you help me to have enough trust that in the midst of my problem, I'll still look for the opportunity. God, you're making me. God, you're fashioning me into something great. Come on, right now, wherever you are, just begin to call on the name of Jesus right now. Uh, he's making you. He's making you. Uh, he, you don't have to live in fear. God may use this fear to show you that He's still in control. You don't have to live with anxiety because God uh, is a peace speaker. You may feel like you don't know uh, which way to turn, but can I tell you, you can turn to Jesus uh, and He will fix it. He will handle it. He will give you peace uh, in the midst of your storm. My friend, uh, you may not understand it right now, but He's working. Uh, His arms reaching. It's just the blessing of a bowl we just the blessing of a sickness. It's just the blessing of a problem. It's a blessing of the mistakes. Because God is working a miracle in your world. Again, let's just lift our hands and let's lift our voice. Uh, and let's call on Him right now. Jesus, we need you. Bless every hearer. I pray, God, that you would touch everyone that listens today. That your hand would rest on them. You see what they're going through. In the name of Jesus, begin to open their eyes to see you. Uh, let them see how great you are. Let them see that you're the peace speaker and the way maker. Let them know that you are the healer. You are the deliverer. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. And we give you praise today.